Great. Thank you all for your questions, and uh, let's thank Corinne again. Okay, now I'm going to turn over the mic to Professor Susanna Neuer from the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University. Thank you, Karen. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Antje Buitius, who is a professor of geomicrobiology at the University of Bremen and leader of a joint research group on deep sea ecology and technology at the Alfred Wegener Institute of Polar and Marine Research um, in Bremerhaven and the Max Planck Institute for Marine Research and Marine Microbiology in Bremen. She has studied biology, biological oceanography uh, at the University of Hamburg and at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and received her PhD from the University of Bremen in Germany. Antje Birtus is an expert in marine biogeochemistry, biological oceanography, deep sea biology, as well as the microbial ecology of the oceans. She works on polar seas, chemosynthetic ecosystems, and other extreme habitats of the ocean. Antje has led or participated in over 45 research expeditions at sea, that is, and she has coordinated many national and international research efforts. And her current uh, studies and that of her group include the exploration of the Arctic deep sea life under the ice long-term observations of the effects of global warming on polar ecosystems as well as on, on hy hypoxic aquatic ecosystems. Antje Bützius is a member of the German Science Council and of the advisory boards of many international and national research programs, marine in research institutes and museums. She's been awarded with the Medaille de la Société Oceanographie de France, the French uh, the Medal of the French Society of Oceanography, the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize of the German Science Foundation, the Advanced Grant of the European Research Council, among many other honors. And she has been elected an external scientific member of the Max Planck Institute, of Max Planck Society, that is, to the German National Academy Leopoldina and to the Academy of Sciences and Literature of Mines. She is an elected fellow of the American Geophysical Union and of the American Academy of Microbiology. Please join me in welcoming Antje Buitius, and I have the honor of passing over the obligatory Mardi Gras beads. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Susanne. Can I be heard? Is it working? Cool. Excellent. Yeah, I wanted to ask Susanne first if she bought them or if she earned them on Bourbon Street. <laughs> we'll find out later. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers to invite me to give a second uh, plenary talk at, uh, with the theme at the interface of ocean science and society. And it's a perfect match to the fantastic lecture that uh, Corinne just gave to us. And the topic that I chose is also a bit uh, experimental and risky because it's a topic that is relatively new to my group, the questions of ecological aspects of deep sea mining. And so in the first part of the talk, I will give the framework of what do we as scientists have to think about, what do we have to know, uh, what is our framework of mining, deep sea mining in particular, and then in the second part, you'll get some very new unpublished data that are practically straight off from board of the sauna when we uh, studied uh, the aspects, the consequences of deep sea mining just a few months ago. So basically, for many of the plenaries and talks that we heard during this fantastic meeting, and I must say it becomes my favorite meeting for all of the opportunities to talk to ocean scientists about this problem that this large part of Earth is little understood, but we understand that is of so great value to 
how the Earth functions and to humankind, and that we as scientists are in a time where we really have to explain our data in a way that one can understand how the ocean should be valued, protected, how we should actually have a framework of actions um, with the oceans and with the future of the oceans. So a while ago, economists have suggested one problem with preserving, protecting ecosystems, getting the support by society, by politics and industry, is that we speak too little about the values of nature, the values of the ocean. I'm, I find it very conflicting to think that everything in life needs a dollar sign, but I can understand that it helps to really think what some of the services nature provides to us are worth. And what, if we would pretend that the ocean would be a business company and if we could really calculate what the worth of 50% of the oxygen that we breathe is, or all of the habitats and genetic diversity which eventually will be natural products to future generations of people, or the regulating services, the heat that the ocean redistributes, the importance on climate, the carbon storage, if all of that would be put into dollar bills and we would have to think of the value of this company, we may uh, think of that company or the ocean differently. So, so it may be a good idea. Keep it in your mind for a moment to think of values. Of course, since humans walk the earth and we're in contact with aquatic ecosystems and the ocean, we have also used services directly. We call them provisional and cultural services. And just some examples is the fish we eat, 17% of the protein intake of people on Earth come from the ocean, but also the recreational services of the ocean, tourism, a gigantically growing economy, transport of goods, 90% of all of the goods that we are using have been transported across the ocean. So there is a lot of value also in these services. And as Corinna already has pointed out, we are looking towards a further growth of the population on Earth and one that will result in a distribution of people where in 2020 half of Earth's 8 billion people at that time will live around the coast, will live by the sea. So they will probably need another scientific framework of thinking what the ocean does for them, what, how we deal with the ocean in the future. Exactly those values in habitat, provision, food, energy that we take from the ocean, the economy of the ocean, culture, when we measure how we deal with these values and how sustainable we deal with these values for such future generations, we can make maps of value, maps of sustainable use, as Ben Halpern did, a marine biologist. And here on his map of only the, the economical zone of all uh, countries on Earth, you can see that the sustainability, which we can turn into a health index, meaning that it's not totally sustainable what we do, is already everywhere. So the blue color is when we really deal in a sustainable way with these zones, the yellow, if we have already started by using habitats, foods and so on, extracting too much so that the values will not be sustainable. So you can see that it's really high time to think about how we change the ocean. And for me, one of the best examples of how human activities change the ocean, create habitat loss and species loss, is the story of the great whales. My grandfather was a whaler when he was a young man, and I learned from him the story of when he could no longer feed the family from whaling because the whales declined so rapidly that from each year when they went to Antarctica, they had lesser and lesser, and eventually it was not a business anymore. You see this graph here of how human action has actually changed the picture of the um, decline of the whale populations. Now, what is really important to note is that after the first concerns over crashing numbers, for the rest of the time when protection measures took place, the whales never returned to the levels that they had in 1880. So this is one of these examples where we humans have changed, learned, recognized, started protecting, but still it may mean that for generations you're losing habitat and species. It's something to think about. And we call this problem of the human mindset um, shifting baseline. It's a great concept by Daniel Pauli. And what it actually means is that although we are so clever and can understand a lot of things, uh, measure ocean uh, circulation, find gravitational waves and all of that, we have a concept problem in the sense that we are learning our environment when we grow 
and we are keeping a memory of a good environmental status of our youth maybe and we cannot really think back. We don't have a good measure of what would be our perfect habitat in which we want to live. And from generation to generation we are happy with less and uh, that is called the shifting baseline problem. So we have to recognize a status in which we want to live and try to work um, a framework um, that, that captures that. So just a few examples because we often hear criticism when we talk about habitat loss and species loss that all of this is exaggerated and it's just to get more money for your research. There are so many examples of organisms that we have lost that we probably would have loved to encounter. The dodo, sea mink, there are so many examples of organisms that uh, human activities um, have lost from the ocean. And just as we speak, during this conference there is the great um, IPBES meeting, the fourth, so the international, uh, uh, the intergovernmental uh, panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services in Kuala Lumpur. And like the IPCC, this is a platform where we hope scientists can talk directly to politicians. So why do I tell all of this and then turn to the deep sea? Because you all know that the deep sea is huge and vast and deep and dark and we are not living there. We cannot really destroy habitats. We may worry about climate change and consequences for the deep sea, but other than that, why would we start worrying about the deep sea? The deep sea is really a giant space on Earth, and it is full of life that we don't know. The new estimates from the Census of Marine Life are that critters like this one, there are millions that are unknown, and when we turn to bacteria, the estimate is a billion of bacterial species that we don't know, but that are, who are a significant part of the function of Earth. In fact, our knowledge is so tiny that when we just think about the proportion we have sampled or seen or investigated, it's tiny numbers. You can even not pronounce them, how small they are, for this vast area of deep sea. So that may be enough of a framework to decide if we can just take a little space of this deep sea, would it ever matter because there's so much of it? And that's exactly a really fundamental scientific question. And that brings us to the question of taking resources from the deep sea. If it's so large, if it's such a huge dimension, why should it be a problem of using a bit more deep sea for us humans? There are already many examples where we know we create problems. The most prominent one, again, deep sea fisheries, deep sea gas and oil. We know that it's a new resource we can take from deeper and deeper, but it is problematic, it is highly risky. We know that, especially you here in Louisiana know that. There are many, many ways, new way, ideas about using the ocean, for example, waste uh, disposal. Uh, there are new proposals to put tail tailings of uh, mine, of landmines from land into the sea. There are hopes that eventually we can use all of this diversity of life in the deep sea for better natural products. Probably the greatest resource that there is in the ocean is that of metals. So here you see a uh, framework of the ocean seafloor and you see the different resources that we have. For example, gas and oil, I already mentioned that and we use that already, but then there are other minerals on the shelf sand and gravel, but the deeper you go, for example, phosphorides or really in the open ocean, in the high seas, manganese crusts, massive sulfides and manganese nodules. And that's the topic of the research that I'm going to present in a moment. So we call them polymetallic nodules, and it's a famous resource that was discovered very early on. In fact, the Challenger expedition came home with descriptions and, and drawings of these polymetallic nodules, saying there's something really weird, some big potatoes of iron in the deep ocean to be harvested. In the 60s and 70s, the first scientists and engineers got together to think about ways of harvesting these because one could start calculating, and this is science as well, what with our land metal resources, will they really be enough for industrialization and all the population growth? And it was calculated that iron, manganese, but mostly some rarer metals like copper, nickel, and all of that, what you need to make steel, that this could be an ending resource on land and that it may be really relevant to take it from the ocean. But what was learned about these manganese nodules was that they are a weird kind of resource because, in fact, it's the slowest growing precipitate that we know of. One nodule, as big as a fist, has an age of two to three million years. 
when you take it from the ocean floor because it's a it's a precipitation process of metals in which probably bacteria ate the precipitation process and nodules survive on the surface of the seafloor in areas where sedimentation is so slow that the growth of the nodule is faster than the sedimentation rate. That's why we have them at the surface. So a very slow uh, growing resource, that is. But it is interesting for its metal content. Here you see a list of metals in there, and especially for uh, nickel, and yttrium, for example, but also copper, the resources in the ocean can be large or as large as on land, and we haven't tapped into them. So it really gives hope for a continuation of industrial and econo economic growth. However, the largest fraction of the nodules is actually manganese and iron, where we are not so limited. Why would we need all of these metals? I like this graph because it shows you how resource questions are interlinked. This is about energy, the, the way we use energy, and the way that this kind of energy use creates a need for metals. And the new energies that we actually need to use to reduce CO2 um, are a completely different set than in old times, and we have the need for new resources, and these resources are limiting much before gas and oil and coal will end. There's another problem that makes the deep sea an attractive uh, resource, and that is that the availability of these rare minerals on Earth is actually very localized, not evenly distributed. In this graph, you see that most of the resources actually are on the Asian continent, very little in Europe and North America. So countries who are industrialized who need a lot, especially when they turn to new, um, new technologies, they are starved of these metal resources. They cannot take them from their own grounds. The remaining land resources are currently calculated with 40 to 60 years for elements like copper and nickel. And if we would use, if we would go to the deep sea and take some of the resources there, we could expand it to 60 or 160 years, and maybe then new materials are invented. There is a third problem why people want to turn, and scientists too, and all kinds of people want to turn to the ocean for metals as a resource. And that is that metal mining on land is actually really a toxic business. If you have uh, read the, the, the big disaster about the Samarco Dam, an iron mining Brazilian company that, uh, uh, because a dam broke, uh, destroyed a, a large part, um, a, a Brazilian settlement, killed people. If you think of all of the um, situations where, where people are threatened by, uh, by land mining, if you think of accidents, if, if you think of our troubles on land, the, the asset mining drainage, the tailing problem, where should the tailing go? So all of this tells you that on land where we live and where we continue to grow, it's really difficult to, to give that land to metal mining. Why not take it from the ocean where no one is living? So because of all of these arguments that I've now given to you, since the 70s, people were thinking and preparing for metal mining in the deep sea. And when you look at this picture here, it's a web uh, GIS of the International Seabird Authority that marks all of the different potentials for metals to be mined from the deep sea floor, and there's a lot everywhere, and the nodules are especially abundant in the Pacific. In 2000s, there was an estimate by economists of what the value of metals in the deep sea would be, and it was estimated to 5,000 trillion US dollar of resources that we could harvest. If that number doesn't say anything to you because you, you can't scale up from your salary to 5,000 trillion US dollars, then I can help you a little. I looked it up. It is 60 to 70 years the global world uh, net product. So an amazing value in the deep ocean. Completely understandable that some industry is preparing for getting into that business. What about the policies? So the International Seabird Authority was founded in the framework of the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and it since then regulates the licenses for exploration and eventually exploitation in the deep seas. So you go there, you write an application, and you can get a license. And they also regulate the environmental impact. They request studies uh, of the industry and of the nations who have a license. And there is a general obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment, including rare species, in the policy for eventually mining the deep seas. So where is the problem? Here, you look at the current outline of the licenses. Many, many nations have licenses in the Pacific. Um, you see in the small inset on the right bottom side the area that has these nodules. It's an area of 4 million square kilometers, 
And uh, it is uh, really large, like a, a fraction of, uh, of South America where the nodules are lying. And it was calculated that we need, for an industrial size activity, it needs a, 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 plow, a, a collection of nodules for more than 200 square kilometers per year for over 20 years, and then this business could be worthwhile, even though it's far away, deep in the ocean, and we have to invent all kinds of new technologies. There is a problem with nodule distribution, so here you see this map. Um, actually, the nodules are not evenly distributed, they vary in size, they vary also on small scales within these licensed areas. So, special, um, a special property of these nodule fields is that the nodules are then always at the surface. Here you see one of such nodules, and when you look at it, uh, you can see that on the bottom of the nodule there's some sediment sticking. So the nodules usually uh, are 20 to 30 centimeters, centimeters buried into the ocean seafloor, and basically now when you imagine we take these nodule sources, it's really a 2D resource. It's not like with coal or, or oil, oil and gas where you make a hole and then you extract something from the underground, but you really have to take off the surface. This is one example of how it is imagined that the technologies of mining should work. You see here a scenario. Um, the picture is from Nautilus uh, Minerals. They are preparing for such kinds of minings uh, in the next uh, few years. And uh, you have to imagine that you need large instruments that would roll over the seafloor basically and collect all of these nodules from the surface. So there are two aspects of impact that need to be considered. And I will, from now on, talk mostly about one, that is the extraction, the mining, so when you would remove nodules. Another interesting one is, of course, the waste that needs to be dumped in the ocean, process waters and tailings. Think of for a moment about the problem now. So there should be the ocean surface plowed for nodules, but the obligation is to protect and preserve the marine environment, including rare species. How can that go together and what scientific questions arise from this? What would be the good environmental status is one of the first questions, really important. What's the baseline with which we want our deep seas to work? What ecosystem functions could be at risk? What variables should be monitored? Which species are to be protected and how? And how could one compensate for disturbance? At this meeting, we had several uh, gatherings, several um, sessions where, where deep sea scientists and others discussed these problems. And uh, actually, the, the scientists, scientific networking is growing again, like in the 70s when it was about to happen, but then ended. Um, and um, in the next few slides, I would like to show you what we have in terms of data and what we need in terms of data. So here you see a list of previous studies that were carried out at the first time when Mining of deep sea nodules was really a hot topic. In the 70s and 80s, there were several countries that larger scale experiments, exploration, measuring of nodule distributions, measuring of animals. And some started thinking about experiments, pilot studies for mining. In Germany, when I was a student at the University of Hamburg, two scientists prepared for a large scale experiment, Gerd Schriever and Jan Mathiel. And they thought that to ever know what deep sea mining would do to the seafloor and to animals and how we should uh, go about protection, one would need a first area that would be mined. At this time, that was not easily realized, so the scientists proposed, let's just go and as a scientific experiment, plow one square kilometer of ocean. You can imagine that today it would be really difficult to come up with such uh, proposals when you think about the iron fertilization problem and you remember maybe how scientists were stopped doing an iron fertilization experiment that was minor to the natural iron fertilization that is always occurring. You can see that we scientists can also be in conflict with society because some just want no interaction, ignoring that the interaction may come on a much larger scale. So what Gerd Schrieber and Jan Mathiel did in 1989, they went with the research vessel Sonne to the Pacific, to an area 4,000 uh, 4, meters deep, where Germany had a license for nodules, and they built this plow. The engineer who built that plow is still working in my group today, and they used this plow to scratch the surface to remove the nodules. They were quite successful at this time. They were the first ones to actually have camera recordings of the seafloor so they could follow what they did. And this is the plow track that you can see here. So basically what you see here are really the, the scratches that the plow did. It looks like on every acre on land. So you see ripples, you see that sediment is scratched off, you see these whitish spots 
that are where the subsurface sediments are looking out and the nodules are pushed to the side. And they did this over and over again. There was an entire expedition, a research expedition spent plowing the deep sea and they got much laughed at at that time. And in fact, at some conferences, there were people also quite aggressive turning against such type of experiment because it was also deemed kind of useless because it's a still a small scale experiment. It can make you angry to think that someone scratched the square kilometer of seafloor compared to industrial mining with 200 kilo square kilometers per year. It's a tiny experiment. So with that experiment, they had the chance to come back to this area again and again. And so they returned after half a year, three years, and seven years to study how the fauna reacted to this kind of disturbance. On the, on the bottom, you see the disturbance after uh, right away. And after seven years, a bit of sedimentation came. Some of the plow tracks settled in. And um, they could always go and sample disturbed track versus undisturbed track and outside reference area. And by this, they gathered data. Seven years after they started this experiment, the interest in manganese nodule mining was completely lost because the nickel price crashed to such a low and never returned to these exceptionally high prices they were at in the 70s. So the interest ended in this type of experimentation. And uh, basically, there was no further scientific funding to carry it out. But this is what they left in, uh, um, at, at that time. They left basically an area in the seafloor. Um, you see this circle that we call DEA, that is called experimental area with a highly disturbed area in the middle and some not so disturbed areas outside and a reference area that was never disturbed with nodules, with lesser nodules. And what they also left were some first data about the first seven years of recovery, and they cared mostly about the small benthic fauna. When you have been to Jack Middleberg's talk, you've heard all about them. They are making the basic functions of sediment dwelling, bioturbation, giving food to the bacteria who re which remineralize. And please note here the sediment coloring. So the surface where the nodule sticks in is brown from manganese oxides, and below is some whitish material. And so this top brownish surface with all the worms, all the bacteria, is what would be removed in terms of when, when mining would come to pass. They left data like these data, where immediately after the disturbance, they went and caught for the macrofauna, so organisms below one centimeter size. They counted polychaetes, crustaceans, and, and bivalvia clams. And they found that their disturbance was effective, so they reduced all of these animals to maybe 10% or 20% of the original distribution. So they didn't sterilize the seafloor, but they really had made an impact. Three years after, it was my first expedition ever at sea. As a young student, I was going on this mission to the Pacific. I didn't care about nodules. I cared a lot about the experience going to the South Pacific, and I got my equatorial baptism. Um, and uh, this is the original picture of the sailors who, who gave me uh, the name of a, a, a box fish. And um, this expedition I had never forgotten because it was the first time that I could really see the seafloor with my own eyes, with the camera techniques, and look at such a disturbance experiment. And as I was a student, I was wondering, uh, the people must be crazy to even think of such a resource in such a slow oligotrophic habitat. And then I forgot about it, and we only returned when we really returned. So about a year ago, Geoma, Avi, Marum, so several German institutions got called and asked, were you willing to get the new research vessel Sonne to go out to this area again and look what has happened after 26 years? And of course, we were all really enthusiastic about it, and we wanted to take the best technology we have today to look what has happened to this experiment that was left alone after this time. So think about this. The area where you work, and of course, everyone falls in love with their own research area and subject and the, the habitat that you study, and you go away and you can come back some 26 years later. So of course, it's a fantastic experience. When we went out there, we had the best technology, like the AOV of the Geoma, and the most exciting moment was to go with the robot and map the seafloor and see that the old scar marks were still present at the seafloor. And with the new technology we have today, it took like a few days until we had a complete map of these plow scratches that couldn't be totally measured in in the location 26 years ago because GPS wasn't there, not the precision of, of uh, geospatial reference was, was all not there. So we had this map in the beginning of the expedition, 
and we could actually launch our coring systems right into the tracks, right next to the tracks. We had also diving uh, capacities. We had the ROV of Geoma, and we could uh, dive to the four kilometer steps and really work in the fine scale environment that these plow marks are. And here you see the plow marks, and you can see that we put, we were able to put instruments like the respiration chamber, like push coring and so on, in these plow marks, and we could turn and sample the area next to the plow marks that was undisturbed, and we could go outside and measure also the undisturbed area. At the time when the Discall experiment happened 26 years ago, many technologies were not available. There was no robot diving there. There was no ability to sequence for microbial community studies. There was no possibility to do in situ respiration measurements, and we wanted to do all of that again and add also to your old data series. Here you see us taking push course. So when we dove with the robot, we could actually see that the plow marks left all kinds of weird traces. So we had ripple structures, as they saw before, but we saw that the seafloor was still whitish where it had been changed. So apparently this brown cover where the animals live was not replaced, of course, by low sedimentation. It couldn't have been replaced in that time. But why was it still whitish? There seemed to be subsurface sediment on top of the plow marks still. So basically, we divided our sampling scheme into these plow marks and into these ripples because we weren't sure what was now the biggest impact, that you squeeze sediment or that you scrape sediment. And we wanted with this one mission to really find out how does the basic seafloor function changes. A student of ours, a master's student like I was 26 years before, Tobias von Name, uh, was in charge of measuring biogeochemical data. And so I showed to you now his very first data that got ready only a few weeks ago. And so that you can see with your own eyes, what we found is just a small proportion of the data that have now been evaluated because we only came back in, in, uh, um, in September from that mission. Please take a look at the sediment coloring again. So the brownish layer is the layer with the active animals. The whitish layer below is the subsurface. And uh, the plow 26 years ago had put that whitish material on top and it was still whitish. So we could sample exactly into this subsurface material that was exposed by 26 years. We needed a fresh experiment too. So what we did is we took the epibenthic sledge. It's a common tool of deep sea biologists to, to get some, some, some sea cucumbers up. And we made big stretch marks in this area that were then fresh. And you can see here again, when you look at this photo, whitish subsurface sediments get exposed. The brownish surface layer with the animals gets basically scratched out. And we learned on the side a lot also about benthic trawling by this experiment because we learned how these scar marks will also uh, stay behind. Now a few data, a few data slides. So please take a look. I'm, I'm not so sure you can, I hope you can see it. On the left side, the core that you see is with the brownish layer on top, the reference area. And on the, on the right side of the graph, you can see the whitish material, very little of the brown on top. So we checked first what happened to the surface layer. And uh, please see for the, the habitats, how we name them, references outside of the DEA. Um, track is the plow mark. The white patch is this whitish material that you just saw. EBS is the very fresh epibenthic sledge track, and the remainder of the slides will all be sorted like this. So what we could see is in the white patch, uh, the surface layer was missing, and in the fresh track, also the surface layer was missing. One of the basic benthic functions, as Jack Middleburg had explained, is respiration. Respiration of animals in the seafloor returns minerals, returns nutrients, and uh, returns basically also the CO2 from what has been sinking to the seafloor. And what we found when we looked for the impact is that after 26 years, we could actually measure that within the plow tracks, the respiration of the small animals and the bacteria was half of that of the reference site, 26 years later. So we, we couldn't believe our own eyes and the data at first, so we repeated the measurements and again and again. But where there was a scraping of seafloor surface, there was a really low in the activity. We tried lots of different functional um, um, processes, lots of activity measurements, for example, how bacteria grow when they can grow autotrophically by CO2 fixation. Same pattern. Reference, outside track, and also the top of the ripple showed little impact. When we went to the scrape of surface, we lost basically the autotrophic activity of the bacteria. Then we counted, was the problem 
that, that the bacteria just went away and never returned. Is that possible for bacteria which can duplicate every few days in the deep sea? So we found that where the surface was lost, the bacteria did not grow back. How is that possible? It's unclear. They are not that slow as we could measure, but basically they have lost the organic rich surface and the subsurface sediment has very little for them to eat, so they didn't grow back as our hypothesis. And here you see an even more complex slide. So the dots are bacterial community and dots that are very close to each other means similar bacterial community. And when you now look for the EBS track and the white patch, the bluish, you can see it's offset to the reference community and to the reference uh, structure. And it looks a little bit more like the subsurface community, the yellowish patch, so you can see what has happened. Really, the bacterial community has never returned because their environment is subsurface sediment and not surface sediment. So that's what we learned. 26 years later, not even bacteria, which are the fastest component of the benthic fauna, can return. Not enough for the recovery of seafloor functions. A small other set of data before I come to an end. We also look for the larger animals. Of course, our hearts are with the larger animals, these beautiful sea cucumbers, the deep sea fish, and all of these deep sea corals, they are beautiful to look at, and we surely don't want to lose them. Even if you don't care about deep sea muddy bacteria, um, what about the animals? We've had this tool, the OFOS, the Ocean Floor Observatory System, a super high resolution camera with a lot of light we could take down and map this. And when you were yesterday at Orton Purser's talk in the deep sea biology session, you have seen some of the data that I will now show again. So look at these uh, funny creatures that we find in the, in the South Pacific deep sea. We have these beautiful sea cucumbers. We have a nice octopus. We have uh, some sea anemones, uh, some starfish, some unknown organisms. So this little brown thingy that we saw, uh, we couldn't uh, identify it. Uh, but we uh, actually took the old atlas of 26 years ago, the mega fauna identifications, and we tried to work with these to, to count what has changed. Uh, have the animals returned? So we took, again, the same setup, disturbed versus next to disturbed, plowed rex versus reference. And uh, that's what we followed with the OFOS. We could position the camera so exactly that we could really follow for long stretches in the plow tracks and next to the plow tracks, so we have a lot of data to evaluate right now. For a moment, please look at the seafloor. Uh, here we are in an undisturbed area. The little house that we built for the octopus here is an experiment of our colleagues who wanted to also measure toxicity of metals. Look at these. That's my favorite animal of the deep sea, the Anthropus, who can uh, defecate in a very beautiful spiral. Uh, I have tried it many times. I just don't do it. <laughs> there are the asteroids uh, that eat sipes here. There are sea anemones. Uh, there are really beautiful animals. And when you look closely, you can see that several of them associate with nodules. I love all of these uh, anthozoa, and you often see that animals cling on to each other. So this is a hybrid stalk. We saw many stalks sitting on the nodules that were home to other organisms. Here we're trying to sample some for a DNA barcoding library. This is one of these large isopods uh, that we're trying to collect for a museum. Um, it uh, was a bit resistant, but eventually we could uh, convince it to come along and uh, be sequenced. The, spon the nodules had uh, some small sponges, and it was very interesting to see that in the plow tracks they, they uh, learned to grow again on nodules. They were mostly absent. And then we have, saw all of these behaviors of the deep sea organisms. Here you see the Esther Williams of the deep sea, a sea cucumber that normally crawls but can also swim away when it doesn't like the environment. And our English colleagues did toxicology experiments. When you put a little bit of metal tailing onto them, they will swim up and away. That's the megafauna, and so Orton Purser, who gave the talk yesterday, and is known as one of the most well-dressed deep sea biologists on Earth. <laughs> Sorry, Orton. <laughs> Had to get back to you. <laughs> um, he found a, a fantastic data set. This is like um, a small fraction of what we could analyze by now. But please look at uh, the comparison. So mobile fauna that can swim and crawl can come back into the plow tracks. That is clear. Some of them will have less food, though. Some of those that eat bacteria will be disappointed because there is not so much in, uh, in bacteria to eat. The sessile fauna, when you can look at these data, blue, the plow tracks, green, the undisturbed, you can see that the sessile fauna couldn't come back. That's logical. Their nodules have been removed. They are needing hard ground, so they have been lost. Orton could also find that the 
feeding types have changed. Detritivores that eat sediment detritus or the predators, they are not occurring in the same pro, pro, uh, ratios 26 years after. Especially curious was this association of many organisms or nodules, and we still have to quantify all of that, but our first conclusion that we share with you is that the sessile fauna couldn't have recovered, of course, their nodules are gone. So with this, I come to the most beautiful story of an animal that we all fell in love with, a beautiful small incirate octopus that was already mapped 26 years ago. The octopus lives on a stalk, and what the scientists uh, wrote 26 years ago is that it is eating something that is on the stalk. And when we checked with our high-resolution camera, we saw that this octopus is actually brooding on the stalk. It's a female octopus that lays egg on a stalk that sits on a nodule and then it clings on for five years or so to brood the eggs until it's starved and falls off and the little octopus come out. Uh, that shows you again how dedicated uh, women are to um, <laughs> making a, a good earth. But this octopus is really a fantastic organism and so now these kinds of observations that we make, how else can you make them by you can only go to the deep sea and look at these organisms and then you understand that this is their habitat and this is how they function. Here you see it again, how it's sitting on a stalk. So, I come now to the last slides and I would like to sum up again. You can see from this case study in ocean observation for a problem like deep sea mining that there is a lot of scientific knowledge needed before we can actually decide that we would like to harvest nodules from the deep sea. The impact dimensions, the consequences for ecosystem functions are practically unknown today. We don't know the spatial distributions of any deep sea organisms today. We cannot often tell them apart. We need genetic sequencing to tell them apart plus sampling. We have to understand colonization patterns. We have to understand the speed of their distribution and growth. Some of these organisms like the slow growing octopus, if they need five years to brood, how long will they need to be actually uh, fertile, and all of these questions are unsolved today. Speaking of genetic, after my talk, please stay here, there is a town hall on environmental omics, how to prepare a better infrastructure for having such databases on the distribution of organisms on Earth is one of the key tasks scientists have to deliver. So let us come back to the framework that we set out today, Corinne and her talk on IPCC and I on mine on deep sea impacts on habitat uses, on the questions of what we need to know to assess human impacts. I add one wish to the list of all of the other wishes that came from the plenary speakers. Remember Walter Monk and, and Karl Wunsch and all of them, they said we need data. We need better models for sure, but we also need field observations. In the deep sea, you can't just sample an organism. So you have to understand it when you see it functioning in the deep sea. And we need experiments. We need to take risks. To have larger scale experiments of impacts, it's really important to assess what the, what, how functions will change. And we cannot shy away from such experiments. We know already that human activities are driving major changes in the world oceans, and there are multiple pressures, multiple factors coming together, so we cannot isolate it, see only the problem of nodule mining, when there is at the same time lots of other pressures on the deep sea with warming, with changing of the food input and, and uh, acidification and all of those things. In Europe, we have research programs for the deep sea that are falling under the blue growth strategy. And blue growth means that we have a future potential for better, more economy, more growth, more people, better jobs, taking values from the oceans. That is a concept that has helped funding science. But I have to say I'm quite critical of this idea that endless growth is possible and the next few generations will take it all from the oceans. Because the oceans can be slower. It can be slower. They are darker, slower, deeper, less food, less energy, longer timescales to recover. And we have such problems on land. Do we really want to have them in the ocean? I don't know. I fully understand that there are lots of people who want no hunger, no poverty, who want to have decent jobs and a better economy, and they should have their chances. But how we put all of together that in a framework and still preserve the life below water as one of the sustainable development goals in a fair way for future generations is one tremendous scientific question. With that, I would like to end, and I acknowledge a few people here, my fantastic crew on board when we did these experiments, the funding agencies managing impacts of the deep sea from the EU, the JPI Oceans Program, 
the beautiful octopus that uh, tells us uh, about uh, brooding, and of course the two scientists that took the first risk at the time when no one cared to create a large experiment that is still small compared to industrial impacts and who left this to us to continue studying it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for a fascinating and thought-provoking uh, talk, Antje. And I'm sure we'll have questions, and we have time for a few questions. Thank you, and thank Hi, you. Bob. <laughs> thank, hello. Thank you for your fascinating talk. And, uh, you know, I wrote a book on deep sea in 1973, 42 years ago. Yes, I'm still citing you, Bob. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very kind. And I think the question and comments I have, uh, you know, is about our future. And all of a sudden we found these nodules. Now, believe it or not, we are finding cobalt in sea mounds. Believe it or not, we are finding not nodule, but polymetallic sulfides. My country, that's the United States, has not signed the, you know, you know, the UN Treaty of the Law of the Seas. I wish we'd do, because it's ISA, International Seabed Authority, gives permits. Right now they gave permits, I know, to Russia, India, South Korea. Next 10 years there will be a lot of mining. And we in the United States don't have a voice, not even vote. We are the greatest nation in the world. That must change. But that's besides the point. <laughs> I have looked for mermaids in the deep sea, never found one. Yeah, they were extinct before your time, Bob. That's, uh... But I found 120 <laughs> new species of the isopod that you showed. I think the, the, the comment I want from you is in the nodule mining, you know, the old days, Yalmar Thiel and I worked together, your professor. You put the mud from the bottom and that sinks and kills all the plankton. Now I think in the cobalt mining and other mining, it's going to be bottom up. Plumes are going to come, threaten your lovely octopus, you know, all kinds of creatures. How are we going to solve that problem? Yeah. Yeah, the plume problem is really a big one and we couldn't study it that well this time. Yeah. And uh, actually there are many scientists now actively speaking out against the future plans of, uh, of uh, mine tailings that are going to be done. So you may have never heard of these things, but there are, there are actually plans of using the deep sea again as, as a mining dump site. And if you imagine all of these nodules taking, being taken out, being washed, uh, the, taking only the 1% of valuable metals and the rest has to go back into the deep sea that will create a large plume of course and those ex that would need an experiment to really study it. We did some tiny experiments and we could see that these plumes form and disperse really rapidly. But to really study what it means to organisms to be covered by a few millimeter of sediment from below with some metal rich content, that is really hard. So our English colleagues found that the holoturians that can swim so beautifully they will run away and not return, basically, because they can't stand the metal smell or what it is, but at least they react to it. So what the plume mean in terms of mining is one of the key questions that have not been studied and that is really important to study in the future. Uh, I agree that that was a stunning presentation. And I could also discuss a variety of different geochemical or microbiolog microbiological things, but I detected a hint of enthusiasm in your, in your talk, and I think the thing that we need to do right here in this room is to use your example, and possibly mine, because I think we share something in that respect, and that is for students and for young scientists to recognize how important it is to stay physically connected with your science. You have come a huge way from where you started, and yet you have mud on your hands on every cruise. <laughs> and that is why you know your stuff so well, and why you don't need a script to talk, because you know your stuff. 
And I think that's because we have our hands dirty as well as talking to people. So I want you all to recognize her as a role model, not just for science, but for enthusiasm, which will make your science better. I just met Bob at a picnic bench yesterday, and it turned out that we had both worked in Antarctica on the El Tannin, and he has that enthusiasm, and that's what makes us good scientists, and you are excellent at that. Oh, thanks, Ross. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Hi. Yeah, you showed the picture of the Nautilus uh, undersea mining tractor that they're planning to use there. And I was just interested to, to think about that. And it's really a brute force type method. And compared to the methods that you guys were using with the ROVs where you're going, picking up individual nodules. And I wonder if, if there's any concept of switching from this idea or mindset of mining and the traditional way that we've done it on land and switch to one of more, you know, gathering, right? Uh, and some, you know, in Alaska, for example, we have the beautiful berry fields, wild berries, and we don't use a tractor to go <laughs> plow them. We, we go out and pick them by hand, um, and then we can go pick them later. Um, but I was just wondering if you had some insights mm -hmm. as to, is there going to be a transition of way we think about this and accessing, potentially accessing these without having to even consider all the big implications mm -hmm. of totally destroying the seafloor? Yeah. Well, there are two answers to this. First of all, basically, the, the, the need of, of industry to make it a worthwhile um, business is still a fraction of the entire nodule area. So there is hope that the fraction could be small enough that there would not be species loss or, or that, that it would be good enough comparable to the way we do it on land. We have a landmine, we set aside another habitat. We say we have to prove that there is no species endangered, no breeding ground of an insect or a bird on land before we get to mine. So these concepts can all be done in the oceans. The concept of collecting in a sustainable way, I see two scientific arguments uh, against it. A, the nodules don't grow back. B, when you take them, and we did a lot of ROV experiments with that, when you take the nodule, actually the seafloor sticks to it because there are so many worms that glue their, their tubes and the, sea, the sediment together. There is no system, even if you would have mermaids picking these nodules for you, they would rip off always a large chunk of the seafloor. So there is, that you cannot avoid. You can only say we limit us humans to taking maybe only 5% of the entire nodule belt. But you know, there are other sciences. And when I talk to engineers that deal with metal recycling on land, there is not even 20% of recycling of the metals that we use. We could go to 80%. There are engineering solutions. If we can fly, we can also better recycle metals. There are so many ways of changing our behavior with metals. And I have to say, when I dove into knowledge about metals on land, you know, we don't know where they are. We are using them. We cannot even budget, like we have a carbon budget. There is no Corinne for the metals, unfortunately. We don't know where the metals are with which we have built environments or changed environments. And all of that we could do before going to the deep sea. So that would be my other answer to find a more sustainable way of, of having metals for future generations. <laughs> okay, well, I want to echo the previous comments about what a wonderful role model and how wonderful your enthusiasm is and how contagious it is. So thank you for that, first of all. And then secondly, would you mind speaking kind of following from your last comment about um, uh, metals on land and potential kind of land ocean uh, interfaces. Could you speak a bit more about high latitudes in the Arctic and exposing melting uh, ice yeah. sheets and um, and a bit more about that as well? Thanks. Yeah, of course, that is a, a, a real big concern when the when the ice goes away. There, of course, there are hopes for other industries at, at the moment. The melting of the coasts is uh, leading to a lot of erosion and a lot of uh, leaking of, of sediments and dirt into the sea. Um, the rivers that transport um, also dirt, they will uh, transport more of that. The atmosphere settles then more dirt. So, of course, we know that we have these uh, polar environments that will change along with warming. There are ideas of how the Arctic can also be used, uh, including uh, search for gas and oil. Uh, mining can move up when the, when the seafloor defrosts or when, when the land defrosts. So all of that needs some framework of protection. But um, 
I, my experience is that, that society and politics and industry have kind of changed and the, the kind of value that we all have in our business has changed. And as Corinne expressed hopes for the IPCC process and our ability as scientists to, to speak uh, more loudly and to change the way things happen, I totally believe that we will be able to do that also for the way we use the land resources. My uh, optimism is sometimes a bit dampened when I see how humans interact with each other, but uh, I still have high hopes that um, we find better solutions also, also for the polar environments. Thank you. What a great talk. Um, so I've been following the work of Christina Gurji and uh, the Wedding at All Science paper, and I noticed on your, on your map of the deep sea floor there were the light green MPAs. I know you can't talk about anything, but were you involved with that? And what is the status of that MPA project right yeah. now? So the, the ocean is not well protected. There are the first coastal uh, protection zones. The um, open seas, the high seas, uh, um, I guess the, to the total sum of ocean MPAs, so marine protected areas, is still below 1% when it comes to those that are really where fishing doesn't occur, and that would be a standard for me because of the changes you do. So IUCN and Christina and others have uh, tried really hard to argue for large uh, protected areas in the seas. And the best proposition that I find is one that is actively discussed, uh, has been discussed also in Monaco. Uh, Prince Albert leads a larger um, ocean environmental stewardship program. In fact, we had a meeting here with Lisa Levin and her team, Dozi, to discuss such things. The best strategy that I can think of is the high seas, which are the common heritage of mankind, could probably be a marine protected area because we can, except for the nodules, that's where they mostly are, but for fisheries, for many other activities, we have our exclusive economic zones, we'll have their continuation, we can take resources from there. The value of the high seas for, for resources is relatively small, and maybe we could all agree that this common heritage of mankind is one for genetic resources. And ban fisheries, ban resource, resource taking from there. That's one hope that many scientists have and, and I, I, I'm following them. Thank you very much. So this concludes our plenary sessions and before you all run off, I think this is a great moment to thank the chairs of the meeting, which I don't think I've been thanked. Karen Cassiani, Adina Baitan, Steve Ackelson, everybody. Together with the other vice chairs and the program committee members for a, what has turned out to be a really wonderful meeting, I think. Please, um, I want to thank you for coming before you all run off. Don't forget tomorrow the final poster session, 4 till 6, with drinks and snacks and music. And come to the stand-up stand pop-up talks at 5, select pop-up talks. And maybe some of you saw Paige Martin's performance last night, and you should take advantage of that if you're still in town. Thanks very much for coming, and thanks for everything. <laughs>